When you were a kid, or maybe even now, and you were traveling in the car with the windows down, I'm sure you had the urge to put your hand out the window. When your hand is flat, you can feel the wind flowing above and below your hand, like the airfoil in this picture. If you pitch your hand upwards, your hand will create a pressure difference in the flow. This will naturally push your hand up. And the same can be said about the opposite. Pitching down forces your hand down. Something else you may notice is that with more pitch, there's more drag, pulling your hand towards the back of the car. The first thing to know about aerodynamics is that with lift always comes drag. Hi, my name is Eric Hillsberg, and welcome to Aeronautics 201, where I'll take you through the aero side of aerospace engineering, covering topics in aerodynamics, propulsion, and some special topics. In this video, I'm gonna cover airfoils, the lift generating surfaces found throughout most aircraft and the common surfaces that they make up. My goal is not to cover every detail of the math and physics involved, but to provide an approachable series that builds up intuition and understanding that will serve as a good foundation. And as always, if there's a topic you'd like me to cover, let me know below. Now, without further ado, let's get into airfoils and the common aerodynamic surfaces. Let's start with how planes fly, which is by generating lift. Aircraft wings are airfoils, which are designed to create lift with minimal drag. There are a lot of inaccurate and misleading descriptions of how airfoils generate lift on the internet, like the equal transit time theory, particle kinetics theory, and Venturi theory. So I'd like to borrow one from a professor at Michigan. I highly recommend you watch the full video if you'd like a better understanding. Okay, so lift is a reaction force, a la Newton's third law, experienced by the airfoil due to its turning the flow downwards. If the fluid curves, there must be a pressure difference. If the pressure above is higher relative to below, this pushes downward on the fluid. So if we take a look at the flow over an airfoil, we can see that the flow turns downward. But why is that? Well, we know that for lift to be generated, there must be a pressure difference between the top and bottom. And relative to the ambient pressure, the top of the airfoil must be at a lower pressure due to the curvature downward. And on the bottom, there must be a relatively higher pressure compared to the ambient, turning the flow downward there. So as I said, this pressure difference turning the flow downward is what gives us lift. Another way to think about this is that momentum must be conserved. If the fluid is pushed down, that momentum must be conserved in form of lift on the wing. So without venturing into the complicated math of the Navier-Stokes equations, this is the general idea of how a subsonic airfoil works to generate lift. I'll be sure to cover some higher speed flows in a future video. But how do we calculate the lift on the airfoil? There are two main variables, velocity and angle of attack. The faster the airflow is relative to the foil, the greater the lift. As the velocity decreases, at a certain speed, the airfoil doesn't generate enough lift to balance out the weight. This can be referred to as the stall speed. But this is not the only way to stall. The angle of attack is the angle between the airfoil and the oncoming flow. The higher the angle of attack, the more lift is generated, up to a point. Similarly to trying to turn a car too fast and skidding out, you can ask too much of your airfoil, and this will lead to a stall. Think back to the last time you threw a paper airplane. Did it slowly begin to pitch up until it seemed to no longer have lift and begin to fall? only for this process to repeat over and over until it hit the ground? Well, this is something that all planes have to account for. If a plane tries to ascend too sharply at too high of an angle of attack, it will no longer generate lift and can fall out of the sky. This happens due to something called flow separation, as can be seen in this airflow diagram. At high angles of attack, the flow will begin to turn turbulent, creating vortices that reduce lift. But it's important to note that drag continues to increase. Yep. That's right, we can't forget about drag. Similarly, these variables also affect the drag of the airfoil. Pause here if you want to take a closer look. So that's how aircraft wings generate lift, but how does the plane actually maneuver and rotate itself? Before I can answer that question, I need to make sure we're all on the same page about the coordinate frames we're going to be using to talk about control. The center of mass defines the origin, and left and right will be from the perspective of a pilot. A plane has six degrees of freedom, it can move in the XYZ, and it can rotate about the XYZ. The X-axis extends from the tail of the plane to the front, and this is the longitudinal axis. Rotation around this is roll. The Y-axis extends from the left to the right, and this is the lateral axis. Rotation around this is pitch. 
The z-axis extends from the top of the plane to the bottom. This is the vertical axis. Rotation around this is called yaw. Now that we have defined the coordinate system, let's start with a simplified example. A plane in 2D. It's moving longitudinally forward and can pitch up or down to move vertically. This plane has perfectly balanced forces along the two dimensions. The plane has a mass or weight force. This is balanced by the lift generated by the airfoils of the plane. And as we know, with lift comes drag, but there's also additional drag from the body of the plane. This is balanced by the thrust generated by the engine. This plane is in what we call steady state, and to maneuver the plane, you must upset this balance. To do that, aircraft have movable airfoils on their extremities to create a torque and rotate the plane. These are referred to as the primary control surfaces. There are three axes about which a plane needs to rotate, so it makes sense that aircraft have some variation of these three primary control surfaces. The elevator is located on the trailing edge of the horizontal stabilizer on the tail of the plane. The ailerons are located on the outside trailing edges of the wings. And the rudder is located on the trailing edge of the vertical stabilizer. These surfaces work by turning the airflow, effectively creating lift in the direction of rotation. Each surface is usually located as far as possible from the center of mass of the plane in order to maximize the moment they create, or in other words, to allow for the most efficient rotation. The elevator controls the pitch of the plane. Since it's located on the tail of the plane, if it is deflected upwards, the airflow pushes the tail down so the plane pitches upwards. If it is deflected downwards, the plane pitches downwards. The ailerons control the roll of the plane. Being located on the outside wings, they deflect in opposite directions in order to create this rolling motion. If the right aileron is up, the right wing will be forced down by the airflow, and the left aileron will be down, forcing that wing upwards. As a result, the plane will begin to roll to the right. The rudder controls the yaw of the plane. It is located on the tail of the plane, and if it is deflected to the right, the tail of the plane will be forced to the left, and as a result, the plane will yaw rightwards. Now we know how aircraft create torques in order to rotate themselves. But aircraft also need to be able to operate in a wide range of conditions throughout the course of a flight. The wings are usually designed with efficiency at steady state in mind, so, to be able to take off, land, and slow down, the airfoils around the plane contain secondary control surfaces, commonly referred to as wing modifiers. These surfaces are used to modify the airflow over the control surfaces and wings, and because of this, they vary greatly from aircraft to aircraft depending on the missions that they are designed for. There are five general types of secondary control surfaces. Tabs, flaps, slats, spoilers, and air brakes. Sometimes a plane will have a want meaning it will begin to rotate and veer off the desired course without correction. This is usually due to some sort of weight imbalance due to passengers or cargo. Without tabs, the pilot would need to constantly use the control surfaces to keep the plane on track. But with trim tabs, this need is alleviated. These small tabs are located within the primary control surfaces, but are actuated independently from the surface. If a plane has extra weight in the front, the pilot can use the trim tabs in the elevator to reduce the lift in the tail and prevent the plane from pitching down. The next control surface, flaps, can be thought of as a way to extend the wing and turn more air. This increases the lift and drag, so they are commonly used to decrease the takeoff and landing distances. Once the plane is in the air, these surfaces are retracted back into the wing. There are many configurations and kinds of flaps, but they are usually located on the trailing edge of the wing between the ailerons. In a similar way, slats are used as an extension of the wing, however, they are almost always found on the leading edge of the wing. By extending the wing, these surfaces increase the lift and drag, allowing the wing to operate at higher angles of attack and slower speeds. This allows for shorter takeoff and landing distances, as well as low speed maneuvers that would normally result in a stall. These surfaces are retracted back in during normal flight to reduce drag. They are most common on high-speed turbojet aircraft like today's airliners. As the name suggests, spoilers spoil the airflow over the wings. They are located on the top of the wings in order to direct the airflow upwards and detach it from the wing, creating a controlled stall. This reduces lift in a controlled way while also increasing drag. There are two main types of spoilers, those which are used in mid-air to increase the descent rate, and these can also act as ailerons and those which are used on landing to transfer weight of the aircraft from the wings to the wheels to allow for more braking. The last kind of control surface we will cover is the least common. 
The air brake is used to increase drag, to slow down the plane, and assist in descent and landing. There are many possible configurations depending on the use case, but the two most common are those that extend outward from the tail, to have little effect on lift, and those which are located above and below the wing. If you've made it this far, thank you so much. Please like and subscribe so you don't miss any future videos, and I hope you found this video valuable and now have some more intuition about how aircraft fly. Be on the lookout for the next video in my series covering aircraft stability, and if you're interested in the other side of aerospace engineering, check out my Astronautics 201 series. See you next time.